So uh, my name is John. Um, uh, I'm the CTO of Stormforge. Uh, we have a machine learning powered platform to optimize resources uh, on Kubernetes. Um, my background is applied maths, machine learning, um, but been working with Kubernetes for four or five year years now and understand the sort of uh, the resource side of it fairly well. So hopefully can teach people a few things today. Um, so the first question, uh, why should people care about Kubernetes resource management? And um, there's three things or three problems that you uh, need to need, you need to manage your resources properly if you want to solve on Kubernetes. The first is performance and reliability issues. If workloads aren't getting the correct resources, then you'll run out and you'll have downtime, pods will crash, etc. And no one wants that. Um, the second is cloud costs. Um, if developers are coming in, picking resources which are way too high, then the application will be reliable. It'll just be extremely expensive. I think Datadog did a survey a few years ago and they found that it's something like most Kubernetes clusters, the resource utilization is only 30%. So people are paying two or three times more than they need. And this is an extremely common problem. And then the final part, which is probably very relevant to the platform engineering community, is you start to scale up and create large multi-tenant clusters. And you need to make sure that you can onboard people smoothly onto these clusters without um, drowning yourselves in noise and manual tasks and providing sort of a reliable uh, experience for developers. So that's why resource, manage ma resource management matters. Um, what tools does Kubernetes have uh, to solve this. So we're gonna start this, this is structured sort of from the container out. So how it works for a single container, then how it interacts, individual containers interact with the rest of the Kubernetes cluster. And then finally, um, what sort of uh, tools Kubernetes ships with to help manage this at scale. So the first, um, requests and limits. So these are the two main building blocks that Kubernetes exposes to let people manage resources. You set them, you can set them for um, CPU memory. There's a few other resources, but CPU and memory are the main one. And you set requests. Requests are the minimum, um, the minimum resources guaranteed to that part. So if you say 250 millicores, then you are guaranteed to get at least 250 millicores. Um, limits are the other end of that. That's the maximum. So if you say the limits are 500 millicores, that means that that container can never use more than 500 millicores. And I've done the examples for CPU, but it works similarly for memory. And then the way you define this, as with all things Kubernetes, is in YAML. So if you go into your um, pod template, you have uh, the list of containers. There's a resources section. Um, so normally when I do this talk live, I ask the question, how many people have heard of requests and limits, but 90% of the hands go up. And then the follow on question is how many people actually know how they work under the hood and far, far fewer hands go up. Um, but as with many things uh, related to Kubernetes, the devil can be in the details. So what does Kubernetes actually do with the requests and limits that you're setting? So um, Kubernetes um, passes them to the kubelet and then the kubelet runs um, on each node and is responsible for isolating containers uh, running on that node from each other. And there's a whole there's a whole sort of variety of different types of isolation required, process isolation, um, uh, networking, et cetera. Uh, for resources, um, what it's using is uh, something called C group. So C group is the tool which does resource isolation on the node. And then the Kubla is translating your requests and limits into C group configuration. Every container gets its own C group. And then for CPU, uh, it's translating into, um, sorry, one second. Let me just uh, check, I'm looking at the chat. Um, um, it's translating the uh, CPU requests and limits into um, the CFS, completely fair scheduler um, configuration. So the first thing it does is it takes the CFS, uh, the requests and converts them into CFS shares. 
So the exact calculation um, is a little complicated, but a share is basically a priority or a weight that you have um, for access to CPU time. And so if you set, uh, if you set, imagine, so I have an example down here with 2000 millicores, uh, you can see what's gonna happen is the scheduler is gonna come in, it's gonna place various containers on the nodes. You can see we have two small engine X ones, a compute heavy machine learning worker and a cache, which is sort of intermediate. And then a whole bunch of empty space on the node. And what's gonna happen is it's one thing to say, okay, I get 500 millicores, but as the amount of empty space on the node changes, the actual CPU available to the workload is gonna change. And eventually you may run out of space and then interesting things can happen. So requests control the priority you have to CPU time and then limits, um, are translated into CFS quotas. So CFS has um, a quota enforcement built into um, built into the scheduler. Uh, we strongly advise people not to use this um, because uh, people have found that the actual overhead associated with enforcement can cause performance problems. Uh, so you might um, think that all you're doing is going in and say, don't let uh, this go over 500 millicores. And if you're staying at 200 most of the time, it won't do anything, but it can actually cause a variety of issues. So we strongly um, uh, advise people to steer clear of limits. And uh, yeah, uh, looking at the chat, oh, the comment in the chat, the slides will be available afterwards. So you should have the links. Um, both talks were from KubeCon's, uh, I think one was last year, one was the year before. They go into all the gory details. Um, and both talks were fantastic. Um, so that's how the translation works for CPU. Um, the first version of Kubernetes uh, started with C group V1. Um, and the specific uh, sort of issues with performance problems, my understanding is this is a C group V1 problem. Uh, C group V2, um, I don't know exactly when it launched, but I think it was um, GA in Kubernetes in version 1.25 or 1.26 that you had the option to use it. Uh, the cloud providers, I believe, are rolling them out. And then I think it will be interesting to see um, if the best practice around CPU limits changes um, with uh, the sort of migration to C group V2. Um, I didn't talk about memory uh, here. Um, just because I think it's much less interesting. Um, what happens is the Kubla doesn't use the memory requests and um, it passes the uh, memory limit to the C group configuration and it just sets the maximum it can be and it gets um killed uh, if it hits that value. My understanding is that on C group V2, that the request and limit is actually going to be, both of them are gonna be used by C group and there's a feature in C group V2, which lets um, there to be sort of a soft limit and a sort of memory pressure. So if you go above the requests, but haven't hit the limits, then C group will encourage you to reclaim memory a little bit faster and uh, will try and stop the growth um, without actually killing you. But then eventually if you do hit the limit, the um killer will step in. Um, so that was a lot of, um, discussion, um, but I think it's always a little bit easier to see it live. So I have a short demo. Um, second. Right. Can everyone see my screen? I hope you see my screen. Yes, I'll confirm. Hey. Hey, great. Um, so I have a simple test cluster uh, stood up here um, and uh, it's got a single node, just to make things easy. Um, uh, the node has two CPU. Um, there's a little bit of overhead for the Kubla, the other sort of components run by Kubernetes. Um, so there's an allocatable space of just over 1900 uh, millicores. And then there's no pods running in the default namespace. Uh, we'll use that in a second. But I do have um, a Prometheus server up and running, which is gonna scrape 
um, C advisor, and that will provide the usage metrics. Um, and this is the way that Kubernetes tracks resource usage on the nodes. So um, the demo is based around something called the resource consumer. It's a component uh, used for testing in Kubernetes. I think it's in the main repo. And the idea is it gives you a way to programmatically consume resources to test things like auto scaling, stress, tense, stress testing, HPA, VPA, et cetera. Um, and uh, let's see. So we're gonna create three workloads. And the three workloads, uh, have, um, sorry, I'm just watching the chat. Um, the three workloads, uh, are configured with different requests and limit settings. Um, actually, let me, uh, just do that now. Um, so first we have, uh, a greedy, uh, an at-risk workload. So the at-risk workload has the resource consumer container, but is setting no requests and limits. So it is guaranteed nothing and there's no maximum. It's just a free for all. So second, we have um, a greedy workload. So the greedy workload is setting CPU requests, um, but it is doing nothing with limits. So it's guaranteed 500 millicores on the two core node, but it is um, it has no cap. And then finally, we have a limited workload. So just building it up. First, we added requests, then we add limits. So here, it's setting the same requests as before, but now the limits um, are uh, a thousand millicores. So it can't consume everything on the node. And then I do that. So let's go through and do it again. So we're creating the workloads, created them again. You see the resources, it's what we said before. No resources, requests only, requests and limits. And then um, let's just check this the next. Uh, so next, we're going to do a few experiments with that. And the whole time we're uh, scraping Prometheus, so we have the data we can look at in a second. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go in and tell all of these containers to use 450 millicores. And on a two core node, that should be everyone should get what they need. And now if I go in and I do. Uh, Just the PromQL to extract usage uh, data from the C advisor metrics. Let's say last minute. Um, I think everyone is getting what they, uh, I think everyone is getting 450. See one down there, which Um, all right, it just takes a second for the, there we go. It just had a small break in the, um, the advisor data. It takes a little bit of time for the scrapes to catch up. So you can see, um, everyone is getting 450 millicores, which is what they requested. And that's fine because there's no resource contention on the node. So the next stage is to see what happens if we actually try and cause resource contention. So here we're gonna leave the at risk, which isn't setting any resources, the limited ones at the current usage, and we're gonna increase the usage for the greedy container. And then we go back to Prometheus and you see two things. First of all, you see a huge spike for the red line, which is the greedy container. We told it to use a thousand millicores, we told it to use 2000, 
and it hasn't quite got there. However, what you can see is it is stealing all of the resources away from the at-risk container. And you might be um, maybe surprised because the only thing which is guaranteed to the the uh, the one which is setting requests is 500, but it's getting all of the priority over the one which isn't setting requests. And that's because when the CFS shares are being handed out, the at-risk container gets nothing. So what that means is if you're not setting CPU requests on your workloads, if there's resource contention, you are absolutely last in line behind every other workload. And um, you're like, it's very easy to run out of resources. The first time uh, I did this demo, it was a just a quick, a quick job. I forgot to set resources on this Prometheus container. I increased the load and it crashed instantly because it was last in line and got zero. So you can see what happens. Um, we ran it for about a minute and then the, uh, the requests only container dropped back to 450. The one which was getting starved caught up. And now we can do the again, do the same again with the container which has limits. And one thing I should highlight here is the green contain uh, the the blue line went way down when we had the uh um the oh, colors changed. Um the yellow line, the one which wasn't sending requests, um was starved of resources during this load spike, but the container which set requests of 500 and was using 450 was fine. It was totally unchanged. And the point is, as long as you're setting your requests appropriately, you will always be safe. It doesn't matter what else is happening on the node, um, you will always be safe. Um, and then you can come in here, we've requested 2,000, um, we're limited at 1,000, we've stopped at 1,000, and the starvation, uh, CPU starvation, has barely impacted the other workload. And it highlights um, that limits, limits are only necessary if other um, pods on the node aren't setting requests. You're setting them to limit noisy neighbors and save um, other workloads, which forgot to set resources. But it's probably not necessary. And given the issues that people run into, oh wait, I meant to just switch tabs. Um, given the re the performance issues that CPU limits can cost uh, cause, we have the following best practices. Um, you should not be setting CPU limits. If you set requests for all of your workloads, limits are totally unnecessary. All they do is potentially waste resources which were available and add extra latency due to how CFS enforces the quotas. Um, the only pros are you can limit noisy neighbors, but if every single person has, um, or every single workload has set CPU requests and memory requests, totally fine. For memory, um, the same applies for requests. You have to set them, otherwise you're taking a huge risk. Um, and for limits, you should be setting them so that the memory growth or a memory leak in one workload doesn't cause instability on the node, but you need to think a little bit more carefully about how you want to set them. Because some people apply setting requests and limits equal to each other. That can work for some workloads. However, if you have JVM workloads which have large memory requirements just on startup, if you want to avoid being um killed, you have to set the requests and limits very, very high to allow for startup, and then your long running utilization will be five, 10%. So you can waste a lot of resources, but that's Java specific. Other types of workloads, like the best practices, I think are a little bit more fluid. So that's individual containers. Um, but as we move out, um, the whole point of Kubernetes is to run lots of containers together. How are requests and limits being used by other Kubernetes components? How do they like interact with other containers running in the cluster? So just a quick review uh, of the Kubernetes architecture. Um, so you have the control plane with the API server, etcd, the scheduler, controller manager, et cetera. Um, and anyone using the cloud provider is having this run for them. And then you have all of your worker nodes where you actually run user workloads. And on each worker node, there's CPU and memory, which needs to be shared out. 
And then there's the kubelet running on each node, which is responsible for managing those containers. And the kubelet does a few different things for resource management. Um, the first thing it does is include C advisor, and it uses this to monitor resource usage on the node. So what I was showing before in Prometheus, um, what I was showing before in Prometheus was using metrics coming out of the Kubla. You can get CPU usage, memory usage, a variety of other great metrics. Um, the Kubla is responsible for that translation um, between Kubernetes configuration and then the configuration of the underlying Linux tools on the node, which are doing various things. Um, for us, it's C group. So it does that translation. Um, and we talked about that before, requests turn into CFS shares, limits turn into CFS quotas. And then the other thing it does for resource management is decide when um, nodes, uh, uh, containers on a node need to be either killed or evicted because the node's running out of resources. And the key concept here that you need to know to understand how the Kubelet treats different types of pods is uh, quality of service classes. So there's three quality of service classes. Um, uh, the um, And all are dictated by how you're setting requests and limits. So if you're not setting any requests and limits, then you're treated as best effort. If you're setting requests and limits for all containers and all resources in the pod, and the requests and limits match in every single case, then it's treated as guaranteed. So it's a pretty high level. And then anything else in between is burstable. So if you set a single limit or a single request for one resource on one container, you become burstable. And then when the kubelet goes in and decide what containers to kill, what containers to evict, it will use uh, the QoS classes or other metrics which align pretty closely with them. So, before we get to eviction um killing, and I think someone made a question about this um, in the chat, uh, how do the um, how do the containers get placed on the nodes? And that's done by the scheduler. The scheduler, when it's making scheduling decisions, only uses requests, which makes sense because that's the minimum guaranteed, and it needs to know that that minimum uh, resource level is available before placing a pod on a node. So limits are completely ignored for scheduling. And then the way the Kubernetes scheduling pipeline works is first there's a bunch of filters and that checks that the node is viable. Um, and um, the filters um, will check that the node isn't currently experiencing resource pressure and make sure that the pod, the requests actually fit into the allocatable space left on the node. And then once you have uh, a whole bunch of viable nodes which pass the filters, then there's a second stage where it goes through and scores and tries to include, um, uh, basically tries to nudge um, the cluster towards having an even resource usage across the different nodes. So the score, there'll be lots of different things that a pod is scored on, like um, there's a preference to place uh, pods from the same workload on different nodes to ensure high availability. And then one of the scoring is to provide uh, even resource balance, uh, usage balance across the different nodes. So you get the pods on the nodes, you start to use a lot of memory uh, or resources. Um, and then memory, there will be no eviction based on CPU, but if you start to run out of memory, the only way for the kubelet to reclaim that is to start evicting pods. Um, and you can see that here. And it does that by looking at pod priorities. Um, and it, it does that by looking at pod priorities, which you can set in the spec. And these can be used to protect mission critical workloads, like the workloads running in Kube system. And then it also looks at who is using the most uh, resources compared to, um, and so it will only affect things to make sure that it's like worthwhile because you reclaim enough space. Um, what we find is that the default eviction threshold in Kubernetes, and very few people are overriding it, is so high that by the time uh, you've hit the eviction threshold, that pro it's like 99% of the size of the node, there's not enough time left before you're just gonna hit the nat natural state, which is running out of space completely. And at that point, pods will start getting to boom killed. Um, 
And the way this is done is influenced by the QoS classes we discussed before. Lower QoS classes are more likely to get killed. Um, and it will look at who is using more than its requests. So if you follow the rules and you're always using less memory than you request, you're at safe, you're safe from being boom killed. Um, which again comes back to why it's so important to set accurate requests on pods, because if not, you run the risk of um, performance reliability um, issues. So that's how the different containers fit together on the node. And then the final thing, and again, I think something which is very uh, relevant for platform engineers is how to manage this at scale. Um, there's not a huge amount available in Kubernetes to help do this. Um, the two main, the two main um, tools are first limit ranges. So limit ranges let you set um, limit ranges let you set defaults for different values uh, at the namespace level. So if you do this, even though all of your developers should be setting requests, limits, etc. If they don't, you can provide defaults. So you can define a uh, default limit request for CPU or memory um, at the container level. Um, and that helps fill in missing gaps uh, for individual containers um, or pods where the resources haven't been set. But then the question is, um, what do you do to limit it at sort of the workload or the larger level? So the second sort of uh, policy enforcement you can do is by setting resource quotas. Um, so you can combine these with limit ranges. So you can handle the individual, um, every container which comes in without a sort of request set is given a default. And then the resource quota will make sure that it doesn't just grow unbounded. Um, and you can, the resource quotas provide just a huge amount of flexibility. You can limit, requests and limits, the total across um, a namespace. You can divide your namespaces up into different priority classes, and then you could limit each of them individually. For example, you want me never want to allow the number of API servers to stop growing if you need to horizontally scale, but you may not want to let background jobs, which are easier to interrupt and wait on, to um, consume more resources. You, you may not want to be as generous with the resources. And you can also set limits on Kubernetes objects. So you can say, don't let this have more than X pods or X jobs, or uh, it depends how you're sort of creating and removing um, Kubernetes resources. So um, I have a second example uh, showing the limit ranges and the resource quotas. Um, Seeing how we're almost at time, and I see a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, I might just describe the demo. Um, recreating the workloads we just had um, without resources set, and then you get them added. It like works exactly as it says on the tin, as you would expect with Kubernetes. I think the thing which is maybe more interesting is how do you actually take this and put it into practice day to day? Um, and I would say the takeaways we have are requests and limits. Requests, unbelievably important, mission critical. If you don't set them accurately, you're going to have reliability problems. You're going to schedule things in the wrong place. Pods will get killed. You will get throttled. Um, it's just unbelievably important to get them right. And you can't just guess high because then your utilization will be so low that you'll pay two, three times what you need to to AWS every month. Um, limits, much, much less important. For CPU, we think the potential performance issues, which go with them, mean that they're not worth it. And you can get all of the benefits of setting CPU limits by just accurately setting CPU requests on every single workload. Um, memory limits are, are important. You should be setting them. And the exact sort of spread you want to have between um, requests and limits uh, is, um, I think, something you need to decide on a use case by use case basis. The trade-off is going to be, if you set them exactly the same, then it's very safe um, because it will be very hard to oversubscribe memory on any of the nodes. 
and you will always have the memory you need and you're unlikely to get evicted because you were sitting between your requests and your limits and someone else needed the memory. Um, so you still need to set the requests to make sure you don't get um killed, but the limits um, shouldn't come into play um, because there's no difference between requests and limits. So that's the safe option to set the two the same. The issue you will run into is you could have very low utilization because you need to provision for the absolute peak. Um, so you could have a larger spread between requests and limits. You'll get high utilization, but you ha may have more disruption um, if you need to continually um, evict pods to reclaim memory. Um, so requests, mission critical, don't use CPU limits. Um, and set memory limits and think carefully about how you want to do it. So that's very easy to say, but then you want to go out to large clusters or you're running many, many clusters and actually do this at scale. And setting container resources at scale is very difficult just because when you get to hundreds, thousands of workloads, actually doing that is just a huge time consuming task. Um, and we see people, we see people go through basically three stages. First, they don't bother setting any requests. Um, it's super easy to do. It's an optional field. And um, that ends very quickly the first time they have performance problems. And they realize that all their workloads are stepping on each other. And this isn't safe to run into production. So they decide they're going to start setting them. Uh, then the question is what to. And your choice is, if you're going to pick a value, um, you can pick high, and it will be expensive but reliable. Or you can pick low, and it will be cheap but unreliable. Everyone picks reliability. So you end up with a very, very high default. Um, I'm sure lots of people have led migrations from VMs to containers and seen the, well, when we ran on VMs, this got two cores and four gigabytes. So that's what it needs on Kubernetes. Um, so people guess high. And it's very, very, very expensive. And eventually the budget, it's just embarrassing to have resource utilization, which is so low. And people then go down the path of going in and being like, okay, we're gonna set them appropriately for each workload. And they'll do things like set up tooling, Grafana dashboards, tell the developers they can go in and they can look at individual workloads, maybe once a month, check the actual usage and adjust manually. Um, and we find this can be very grueling and the level of effort and the sort of toll and like the amount of engineering resources it takes um, isn't worth the actual savings in cloud costs. Uh, so that's where we step in. Um, we have a product which um, uses machine learning plus the automation built into Kubernetes to go in automatically, use the data coming out of Kubernetes um, and say, this workload needs this, this workload needs that. Show you, show you those values, show you how much you could save or maybe not save if you're not setting anything and you need to actually increase your resource usage to avoid production problems. Um, and then we have the automation to roll it out. And we think this is the only sustainable solution to this problem. Doing it manually is too ruling and error prone and just picking a single value for everything and guessing high is too expensive. Um, I put the sign up link here. Uh, we would love, we always love um, people to sign up, try it. If you do, please email us, give us feedback. We love the feedback, it's super useful. Um, but yeah, we think this is a thing which absolutely needs to be done, but people should stop doing it themselves because it's just not a task made for humans. So I'm a little over time, but hopefully not too over time. Um, do we want to do Q and A? Uh, Maria, other ones in the chat in the QA, haven't in the questions channel, I haven't been looking as much. Yeah, we have uh, lots of questions, more and more in the chat. And uh, guys, I see some of uh, some of you um, raise your hands. Unfortunately, this is webinar setup, so if you have questions, please type them in, preferably in um, in the Q and A chat, because um, yeah, I cannot unmute you. Uh, unfortunately, but uh, let's start with, uh, with the Q&A and then I will move over into chat um, to cover everything. But the first question is, 
On multi-tenant clusters, uh, we use limits, not a uh, namespace level, so that there is a fair usage across the cluster. You mentioned setting limits affects performance with regards to uh, CFS. Is there an alternative to enforce this namespace limits? Yeah, a great question. Um, the details on the CFS issues, I'll um, point people to the um, the two talks, uh, the links are here to YouTube. The two talks are fantastic. Um, and they show the various things which can happen, basically unnecessary throttling if you're using C uh, CPU limits. So if you're not gonna use CPU limits, um, you have to, the alternative to using C, uh, CPU limits is to just set CPU requests on everything. If you set your requests reasonably accurately, then limits are unnecessary because you'll always be entitled to the resources you need and limits become almost redundant on for CPU. Um, so yeah, we would say don't use them, just set requests appropriately for all your workloads and you will be fine. Great. Next question. What do you mean uh, the uh, kubelet does not use memory request? Yeah, so um, we dug we dug into this um, when we were putting together the talk to try and figure exactly what kubelet does. Um, for C group V1, um, if you actually trace the code, uh, assuming I didn't make a mistake, we looked at it two, three times, um, the actual value for the memory request is not used by the kubelet. What it does is pass the memory limit that was set in the workload through to C group as a maximum memory, but it is the C, the memory request is completely unused. Where the memory request is used is when scheduling pods um, to nodes. So if the request is the minimum guaranteed and the scheduler will check that that is available on the node um, before scheduling that pod. But the kubelet doesn't use memory requests for V1. For C group V2, I believe it will be used and it will help drive that um, memory pressure uh, feature which um, lets people go over their requests briefly, but then encourages them to reclaim memory uh, quickly. Nice. Uh, so let me just mark it live in the chat and um, I'm going back to the questions in the chat. So just to make sure that I understood correctly, if an app tries to consume more memory and there is a limit, it will be killed um, for apps that might experience burst in then a good idea not to have memory limits. Is that is that then a good idea not to have a memory limit? Sorry. Uh, we would advise um, you should always have memory limits. And the reason being is if you allow completely unbounded growth, um, I've heard stories that eventually it can impact the stability of the node. Like it can start eating into memory that the kubelet wants, and then you can have a larger blast radius than you need. If one pod has a memory leak, that should be the only thing getting impacted, killed, et cetera. So you have to set memory limits. But I think the point you're driving at here is what should be the spread between requests and limits? Um, if you have very, very bursty workloads for memory, you don't want to set them the same because if you set them the same, you're just guaranteeing that your long running utilization will be very low. Um, so if you have bursty workloads, maybe you would have a factor of two, three, four uh, ratio between your requests and limits um, for memory. Great. Uh, is trial and error fail the best way to find the optimal settings for limits, or is there a more scientific way to find the optimal limits? Um, so I kind of feel uh, this question is perfect for us. We think you should use machine learning and automation to solve this because going around and doing something which is a one-off for thousands of workloads um, is just not scalable. It just takes too much time for the actual money you're saving. Um, so uh, we think like you should be used, like if you were to do this manually, the way you would do it is you would create dashboards. Um, you would look at the usage in various scenarios over time, and then you would figure out what's the appropriate level. And that's exactly what the machine learning does. Um, so we think uh, it needs to, it's a problem that needs to be automated. Good. 
Uh, I don't know if there is a question, but more uh, of a comment from your side, from Da. Um, I have problems with throttling unless I set a limit on the CPU. I cannot say uh, set a high request because I can't fit all the ports on a node. The CPU goes up and down a lot. So um, I think this one got answered. Um, yeah, I think Craig's response here was correct. Um, I think uh, if if your nodes, if your if the limit on the size of the request you can set is based on the node. I think you probably need a larger machine type so you can set appropriate requests. Um, where we commonly see this uh, is on monitoring components, etc. If people are running their own Prometheus in a cluster and the cluster's large, that Prometheus part is going to need way more CPU and memory um, than a lot of the um, than a lot of the other workloads in the cluster. So people will have special nodes just for that. But I think you need to increase the machine type and then set the appropriate requests. Um, if the CPU is going up and down a lot and it's very bursty, that might change the level of the request you want. Um, maybe you just set the request a little bit lower and now and then there's spikes, but if there's unallocated or unused, um, uh, if there's unused CPU on the node, that's fine, you'll just dip into it now and then and everyone can do that. And as long as most people are setting appropriate requests, it just works. Cool. Is it good for uh, GVM applications to set both CPU and memory requests and limits? Um, yeah, I think, but, but to echo the point I made before, you always have to set CPU and memory requests, otherwise you're gonna cause a cascading set of issues. Um, for JVM, this is one of the types of workloads we found where you want to have a large spread between the memory requests and limits. Um, and the reason for that is uh, when the JVM starts, it consumes uh, a lot of memory for a short period of time during startup. Um, and if you were to set the requests and limits to be the same, then you would have to give it that amount of memory forever. Um, and that's when you end up with very low uh, resource utilization. So set CPU requests, don't set CPU limits, set memory requests and set the limits to be high enough that you don't get um killed during startup. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, what's the best way to determine number of cores required per port? Um, so that's what the, that's effectively what the, the, Kubler is doing, it's taking the number of cores on the pod and sharing them out. So the way you control that is by setting CPU requests, and then it comes down to the sort of question, which is kind of the thrust of this uh, presentation. How do I pick the right value for requests? And there's a few options you can guess, you can guess high, it'll be expensive, but reliable. I think we think that it should be done um, automatically and the, the machine learning can um, provide the right values. Great. Uh, how many man hours per month are needed before and after Stormforge use? Uh, what percentage of time do they spend on different tasks? I don't know if you so, have that calculated <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so we don't have a great calculation of that. And the reason is, is this um, third stage where people are manually tuning the workload on an ongoing basis. No one does this at scale. So you can't do a before and after because the before isn't do it manually and the after is doing it automatically. The before is um, just don't bother doing this at all. Just guess high and just pay the penalty of high cloud bills. Um, what we can see is the savings and the savings are typically 50%, 60%. And we have people doing this over tens of thousands of workloads uh, spread across many clusters. Um, so it adds up to a very large amount of money. Um, but it's hard to get measures of the man hours because the man hours required to do this manually are so high that no one ever invests them. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, next, uh, I don't know if there is a question, more of a comment uh, back in the Q&A section. The CPU request is mandatory if we give max cores, which will be required only during high throughput uh, through period consumption, but giving high in request CPU will block the resources and necessary even through the port is not utilizing. So giving both requests and limit is the best practice as per the Kubernetes document. Yeah, so this comes back to this comes back to it's basically the um, uh, JVM example for memory, but for a CPU workload which is very spiky. Um, what do you do if you have very large peaks? So for the JVM, it's the memory required during startup, and then long periods with much lower utilization than the peak. Um, the options are to um, either provision for the peak, which is very wasteful, or provision for the every day, which can cause issues. Um, and that's why you have requests and limits. Um, for CPU requests, uh, I don't know the details of the specific high throughput periods, but this is again where automating this problem unlocks a whole new set of options, because you could actually be like, hey, we only need these resources nine to five, or we need them on weekdays, but not weekends. And then if you have the automation to make a larger number of different adjustments, you can actually um, spin up the resources at the right time when you need them. Um, for If it's truly impossible to do that for this app, I think the only choice you have is to provision for something fairly ne near the peak. Otherwise, when you need the resources, you won't have them. muted myself. Uh, cool. I, I didn't see any other um, questions, but uh, let me uh, talk for the next minute so that in case somebody has any other questions, uh, we can still uh, ask them. Uh, as well as, yeah, just want to remind everyone that uh, you'll be able to contact John in the Platform Engineering Slack channel uh, if you have any other questions after the session. We'll send over the webinar uh, slides and the recording to everyone who registered uh, for the session uh, tomorrow. And um, yeah, and we got the question, <laughs> as I expected. If the GVM memory is consuming within the limits spe specified for the GVM values and no issues, but port memory is growing and getting uh, OOM. Um, let's read this again. It's hard without knowing um, the specifics of the workload being described. Um, if the pod memory is growing indefinitely, um, there's probably a memory leak and it's going to get killed eventually, um, regardless of what you set requests and limits to. Um, but I think the key thing is uh, for applications which are like sort of don't have any sort of leaks or any issues like that, just set the requests to the appropriate value. And um, if it's getting room code, you will have to lift the limits. Right. Cool. Um, yes, I guess um, that will be the last question. Once again, thank you so much, John, for leading the session uh, today, just seeing how much uh, engage everyone was and like how many questions uh, you received. I, I truly think it was very, very insightful. Uh, also for everyone who is in platform engineering community and likes our sessions tomorrow, we are going to have um, the session around um, backstage. If you're interested, also join in. Here is the meetup link. Um, this is the one for, for Barcelona, but uh, it's going to be virtual. Um, with Kaspar from uh, Humanitech. And um, yeah, once again, thank you so much for joining uh, the session today. Hope you have an amazing rest of the day. And um, thanks again to John. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. And I'll send the slides. And uh, yeah, any other questions, just ask in the Slack channel. Amazing. Thank you so much. Bye. See you, everyone.